Welcome to Spirits of Whiskey. We explore the wide world of whiskey through the many colorful personalities who make it, promote it, write about it, and more. With each podcast, Carrie Moynihan, a certified bourbon steward and bartender, and yours truly, Philip Dobar, director of the Cocktail Collection, interview whiskey's most important names. From high-profile makers, blenders, and ambassadors, to out-of-the-way innovators and remote pioneers. Join us as we discover the people and elements that give the water of life its spirit. It is Whiskey Wednesday, March 24th, 2021, and you're listening to episode 39. Today, we speak with Lisa Roper Wicker about her whiskey journey to Widow Jane. But first, stay tuned for this week's Whiskey Chronicles. Spirits of Whiskey explores the wide world of whiskey through high-profile and out-of-the-way makers, blenders, writers, ambassadors, innovators, and pioneers. And we've been traveling the world virtually to bring these people and their whiskey journeys to you. As season one of our podcast approaches its finale, we realize just how many great stories we've put aside to share with you at a later date. And that date is here. Beginning in March, Spirits of Whiskey is offering access to its new VIP content page to loyal listeners and whiskey lovers who want more. And when it comes to whiskey, who doesn't want more? For as little as 99 cents a month, you can have access to videos related to topics discussed on past podcasts, as well as our new series, The Malting Floor. At $4.99 a month, you'll enjoy access to our new webcast series and other spin-offs currently in development. And with a premium contribution of $9.99 a month, you'll get all of this before it's available to anyone else. Sign up now to become a supporter at anchor.fm slash spirits hyphen of hyphen whiskey. That's whiskey with an E. Click on the support button and select the contribution level that's right for you. Once you've submitted your payment information, just visit our website, spiritsofwhiskey.com, to create your personal VIP access account. We can't wait to see you in the VIP lounge. Join us. Between 1818 and 1970, natural hydraulic cement was being produced in over 70 locations in the U.S. and Canada. In 1825, a concentration of dolomite limestone deposits was discovered in the Hudson River Valley in southeastern New York State, rendering the region already well known as a summer retreat for Manhattan's ultra-wealthy and for inspiring generations of landscape painters recognized for its high-quality natural cement. So much so that more than half of the 35 million tons of natural cement made in the U.S. was produced there specifically in and around the town of Rosendale, in New York's Ulster County. In fact, because of the town's reputation, Rosendale cement became not only a trade name, but also the generic term commonly used when speaking of it, much like Band-Aid is to bandages and Kleenex is to facial tissue. During the 145-year history of Rosendale cement production, many great American landmarks were constructed from the product. Among them, the base of the Statue of Liberty, the wings of the U.S. Capitol Building, the piers of the Brooklyn Bridge, and 152 feet of the Washington Monument. By the 20th century, Portland cement, in part because of its considerably shorter drying time, began its ascent toward market dominance. Unfortunately for Rosendale, this also marked the beginning of the once-dominant construction giant's decline, a descent that inevitably closed many of New York's dolomite mines. By 1970, Rosendale's Widow Jane mine, originally owned by the Snyder family, met its end. Now, after a 145-year life as a dolomite mine, Widow Jane has been revived, after a fashion. But the origin of the mine's name, one that suggests a colorful origin story, is unclear. We know there were two Janes in the Snyder family, so it's thought that one of them might have inspired its naming. And that mystery only intensifies the eerie atmosphere of its cool, dark spaces. But that hasn't stopped people from exploring it. Today, the Widow Jane Mine is open to the public and is part of the Snyder Estate Natural Cement Historic District. During non-COVID times, the district hosts a variety of events and exhibits, as well as the annual Subterranean Poetry Festival. In addition to being home to walking trails and a small museum commemorating the site's history, the mine has served as an underground recording studio for musicians. But what does any of this have to do with whiskey? Well, in 2012, the Widow Jane Distillery in Brooklyn's Red Hook neighborhood was born. Named after Rosendale's Widow Jane Mine, the distillery employs the area's limestone water in creating its extensive range of whiskies. Up next, we'll learn more about the Widow Jane Mines folklore and some distillery history from our guest, Lisa Roper Wicker. Stay with us. Have you heard about Anchor? It's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. 
There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Today on Spirits of Whiskey, our guest is Lisa Roper Wicker. Lisa is president, head distiller, and blender at Widow Jane Distillery in Red Hook, Brooklyn, New York. Welcome, Lisa. Yes, welcome. Hi, Philip. Hi, Carrie. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. You're so welcome. Of course. We're so excited to have you. I've been keeping an eye on Widow Jane for a while. I would love to hear the origin story of the name along with your whiskey journey story. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. And will she ever get remarried? (laughs) No, she won't. Okay. You've answered that long burning question. So we know. (laughs) Yeah, the widow. The lovely thing is we can mold her into any woman that we want her to be. She's awesome. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, her, the name Widow Jane comes from the Widow Jane Mine in Rosendale, New York. We have our whole water story, and which isn't a story, it's a, it's a reality. and <laughs> The best kind of story. Yes, exactly. But we don't draw our, our water from the, we draw it from a mine that backs up on the Widow Jane Mine. The Widow Jane Mine comes in here and then we back up here. But the name Widow Jane came from the folklore of the Rosendale area. We all know folklore is based on truth, mm-hmm. but nobody knows, everybody disagrees on exactly what that truth is. And the mines are man-made. They mined limestone. They were able to break it down. They heat it and come up with this, I don't quite understand all of it, but a hardening agent for cement. And that cement was so strong and so beautiful and so clean. And it holds, still holds together the Grand Central Station, the base of the Statue of Liberty, oh, wow. the, the bridge, the White House, Washington Monument. But it went out of favor when Portland cement was introduced because of the cost and the drying time. Mm. It was worth the wait, but not in construction. Yeah. Efficiency is what it's all about in the end. Lisa, where did you grow up? I grew up in Bloomington, Indiana, Indiana University. Indeed. A very special place. The nation's largest music conservatory. You know this. That's awesome. I am highly overeducated, and one of my two graduate degrees is in music. Yes. That's amazing. (laughs) Well, congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah, Uh, yeah, sure. I jokingly said, you know, my sisters and I, we grew up with a soundtrack because the little neighborhood that we were in on the edge of the country was a neighborhood, but we would ride our bikes. But like Charlie Gorham, he was a trumpet professor and he, on nice days, he'd stand outside and practice the trumpet. And then Aww. Mr. Ebbs on the Hill, he was the director for the marching band. And then we had all these musicians. And so we actually grew up with the soundtrack while we're playing in the dirt, you know? That's, <laughs> That's beautiful. Awesome. That's just beautiful. Yeah. It's like yeah. not exactly Harold Hill and Gary, Indiana, but it'll do. Yeah. <laughs> I did that play in sixth grade. I was Maud Dunlap. It was fun. Wonderful. What a show. I danced with IU Ballet as a child and all through, yeah, for 10 years. Yeah. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So when you were dancing as a child, listening to the soundtrack on your neighborhood streets, <laughs> did you ever in the million years think that you would be running a distillery in your adulthood? No. I, you know, I was- <laughs> What was I going to do when I grew up? You know, what do you you want to do when you grow up? Because I wanted to do so much, right? It's Mm -hmm. like, oh, I want to do this. I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this. And, you know. Your answer was on point. (laughs) No? Okay. (laughs) <laughs> my father was quite a bit older than other people my age his dad and, and he went to school at king's point just out here on long island and oh wow so i thought oh well that would be a great place to start because he went back and did his graduate work other places but i think mean, that's a great place to start but they didn't let what i'm old enough they didn't let women in at the time wow so king's point is that in king's county in brooklyn it is yeah okay so at the time it was the merchant marine academy oh and, wow okay yeah, and they weren't admitting women yet no because he said he's going to he studied engineering at rose Paul. It's now Rose Holman and at Kings Point, but yeah, yeah. they didn't want women in. Yeah. Or two after I graduated high school and was already in college, they started. All right. So you're dancing on point on a dirt street, <laughs> Indianapolis, Bloomington, accompanied by professors and graduate students. Okay, continue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't argue with my childhood. My father... That sounds pretty enchanted. Yeah, my father treated my sisters and I like girls and raised us like boys. Okay. Wanted us to be very self-sufficient. You know, we didn't know every nine-year-old girl wasn't getting quizzed on tools in the toolbox. And <laughs> just like when we started to drive, we had to know how to change the oil in a tire. It didn't mean we have to do it. He just didn't want us to get taken advantage of. Right. So 
Mm. I was had a lovely, like a lovely childhood. We grew up sailing because of my dad, that was his thing. And, and, but he had like a garden plot and we'd have to stop and work in the garden and then we could go sailing. But he wanted us to learn how, he, like he was a Renaissance man, but he wanted us to learn how to take care of ourselves. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So instead of dreaming of sugar plums, you were identifying plum bobs. Oh yeah, absolutely. I I know my plum bobs. I actually have my father passed away eight years ago, but I have his plum bobs. Oh wow. That's incredible. Incredible. They were able to build these magnificent houses. They say that the highest quality residential construction in this country was in the teens and twenties. And they were leveling these houses with plum bobs, not with modern tools, not with modern levelers. Just incredible. Anyway. So how did we get from there to whiskey? Oh my gosh. <laughs> What did you study? Yeah, I studied journalism. I should have studied science. (laughs) I've told this story so many times because, you know, there is just this whole age thing, right? And I remember enjoying chemistry and biology very much in Mm -hmm. high school. And I should have studied that. But like myself and these two other women in high school, we would stand around with the chemistry teacher, but we would be waiting. He would go talk to the guys. There was a group of guys every morning and they're bugging him. And so he would tell them and we would wait for the leftovers. We'd wait for the guys to come tell us. One of the women was Val Victoria of a class who went to Harvard. So we were not stupid, right? Right, right. And it was just crazy. That's just the thing. And so nobody ever said to me, maybe you have some aptitude for science, you should study this. And so I studied journalism, ended up working in a biology lab, though, for at Indiana University and did technical writing there and photography there for three years. And so ended up doing some science by default. It's like, here, you run these estrace jails. It was a Drosophila protein lab. But uh, yeah, you know, so I ended up doing, doing a little bit by default. And then, but during that time, I grew up with somebody that his dad was a law professor at IU and they owned a family winery. And it was a little, at that time, a concrete block garage. And uh, he wanted to turn his advocation into it. So he got a lot of the Indiana Farm Wineries laws passed with some other gentlemen so that they could have sales on Saturdays and Sundays, knowing that it would take that to make a family winery viable. That's wonderful. About what time period was this? The late 70s and okay. early. 80s, got yes. It, yeah. And so I, you know, ran around with him in high school and college. And that's when I first got my head around the idea that people could actually manufacture alcohol. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of my favorite stories is I probably shouldn't say this. This is my job. Never mind. We're not going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> did you grow up in a drinking household? Yes, I did. I did. Yeah. I just remember my sisters and I were underage and, you know, I grew up sailing and there's a sailing club party and nobody can get the keg tapped. And my father turns around and he goes, you two girls, one more way. And their sisters, I guess, I know my girls can probably tap that. (laughs) I love it. We did. Yeah. (laughs) Nice. nice. I was 14 and creme de menthe was involved. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, and the, the person I told you that I grew up with, with the winery too, I just remember his dad yelling at us, just like, Mr. Law Professor, things have changed so much. He's like, just one bottle apiece, because we'd be running down to the basement <laughs> before we went out, you know? It's like, just one bottle apiece, you guys. Right. <laughs> That's hysterical. A whole bottle. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So from winery to whiskey, what's the transition there? Yeah, the winery where I trained, you know, I started out as a farmhand at a little tiny Indiana winery. I was a cost, I had started a costume company for a small professional dance company. We'd moved back to the Midwest. And um, Columbus is an interesting, Columbus, Indiana, interesting little town. It um, Mm -hmm. had a lot of Fortune 500 companies in it. And so it has the sixth largest concentration of significant architecture in the United States. Cummins Engine had underwritten all of the architecture fees for the public buildings and a lot of private buildings and, and private businesses as well. But so that influence, you know, we had, there was a film, there was like two, there was an orchestra, you know, professional orchestra, professional dance company, but it was an underserved, you know, growing up in Bloomington, the arts were so rich there, but the southeastern part of the state and Western Ohio and Northern Kentucky were kind of an underserved arts area. Where, but I started by accident, you know, started a costume company and worked at that for six years. And then, so two kindergarten moms, you know, my youngest child, and, you know, I was that bad influence mom that taught everybody all the tricks, a field trip bus, you know. Nice. But they had jokingly said they were working at this little family winery in the tasting room. And they said, you know, they're short farmhands. What will you come harvest grapes with us? And I said, sure. And we laughed. And then we kept harvesting and harvesting. And it was time for me to really quit because I'm like, I'm costuming a nutcracker at the same time. And I didn't. I just made it both work. And so another person that had owned another winery knew me and said he'd been bugging me to come to work for him. And finally, he picked up the phone one day and said, after he found out that I was working as a farmhand for another winery, and said, will you please come to work for me in three days? And I knew that's what I was supposed to be doing. Wow. You worked at several wineries along the way, yes? Two wineries, yeah. I was at one for eight years in Brown County, Indiana. And 
They incredibly smart man that trained me to make wine there. You know, people think, oh my gosh, they're making wine and, you know, now make wine in all 50 states. But actually, like Northern Kentucky had the first commercial vineyard in the United States. Ah, uh-huh, wow. Switzerland County, Indiana, uh, you know, on the river, right, had some of the first original vineyards. Uh-huh. And we're talking, you know, a long, almost mm-hmm. 200 years ago. Mm-hmm. Prohibition wiped out the wine industry in Kentucky, you know, especially in Kentucky. It was one of the largest wine producing states. Yeah. Now, I also see that you studied at UC Davis which has, I think, easily the nation's premier enology program. Did you study winemaking there? I did. I did. I did it through their certificate program. Okay. So I would do all their intensives. You know, I'm still raising kids, you know, so I patched my, every time that they had an intensive, I would go, whether it was on filtration or yeast or fermentation. And then Purdue University had a program that kind of modeled themselves after Cornell's program. So eight years, you were at the winery for eight years. Yeah. And so the man that told me to make wine, he was a whiskey drinker. And so my early whiskey experiences were not something that you necessarily want to share, but and <laughs> I was a Jack Daniels drinker on occasion, and he introduced me to better whiskeys, right? And then we start talking about distillation, right? Because you're always talking about alcohol producing when you're producing alcohol. Right. He really gave me the bug for distillation. And I got to a point where my youngest was graduating from high school, and the people we'd been purchasing grapes off of in Kentucky, she just mentioned that we weren't going to be able to make grapes from them the next year because she wanted to start her own winery as a 10-year-old established vineyard. And my boss. By the way, you make it sound as though it's an illicit deal. We're buying grapes off of these people. Well, it can be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it depends on who you're picking up the phone call. But yeah, so it just it just all fell together. So my boss just looked at her and said, Lisa's ready. She could be your consultant. And so I was down in Kentucky at her kitchen table and she and her husband, and she didn't know I was willing to move. And we just said, well, if you're going to move, I'll just, I'd love to hire you as my winemaker. And without talking to anyone or thinking it through, I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and now, were your kids out of the house yet, or were they? I moved to Kentucky the week my daughter started, youngest daughter started college. Wow! So yeah, it was crazy. It was a whirlwind, right? And that project they had all kinds of craziness, but we came out of the gates really well and had some positive attention. That was Limestone Branch. This was at White Moon Winery. Okay. okay. Yes. And so I met Steve Beam during that time because that winery was only a few miles from Steve, and we. Oh wow. We met that October, I'd moved there in August and hit it off and started to be each other's extra set of hands in the evenings. And then the couple that started the winery, unfortunately, decided to divorce. And unfortunately, it's not uncommon in the wine industry for divorce to take down a winery. And mm. I saw the writing on the wall, a couple of friends of mine had lost their job that way. And so I saw the writing mm. on the wall, but I already had the distillation bug, right? That's the reason I went to Kentucky because I uh, one of the first things I did was get myself on the legislative committee with the wine group so that I could get a still, get the laws change to get a still so I could make some brandy. I'm like, if I'm in Kentucky, I'm going to learn how to do mm-hmm. And anyway, so Steve and Paul Beam, I resigned the winery one day, booked a ticket to Sonoma thinking, well, I'll work a harvest in Sonoma and then come back to Kentucky and regroup. And Paul and Steve Beam took me to dinner 24 hours after I resigned the winery and hired me full time for the distillery. Wow. And so I got into distilling much faster than I thought. Baptism by fire, but I'd already started. <laughs> That's a rapid transition there. Yeah. So wait, did you not get to go to Sonoma? I still went to Sonoma and drank oh, okay. a lot of really fabulous fruit. Okay. So distilling. So now we finally made it to <laughs> distilling. Yeah. What were you distilling first? Did you go with brandy first or did you? Brandy first because that's Steve and I had actually started working together on a project because I was making the brandy base for some peach brandies and he, cause he had some client work to do and that's how, so we were already working together. And so it was an easy transition. Although, like I said, it was baptism by fire, you know, the next two years, I, you know, 60, 80 hour weeks, but lots of client work. So lots of exposure to blending and product development and craziness, right? And I got fired when Lexco bought them. Lexco purchased Limestone Branch and I got let go. And so I thought I was going to have to go back to winemaking, which I loved, but not as much as I loved distilling. And so the di- my last for- official day at Limestone Branch, I had a full-time offer on the table from a distillery in South Carolina. I countered with consulting and they accepted that because I was not ready to leave Kentucky because I had too much to learn and I still have too much to learn. And Was that how you founded Saints and Monsters? No, I didn't do that until after a couple more projects. So I, yeah, okay. I started 
consulting. And then Ted Huber picked me up. I'd known Ted for years because they had a 35 year old winery and there was a bunch of coincidences and he'd started a grain distillery. So Ted hired me. I thought I'd stay there forever at Starlight. Watch what they're doing. Watch some of the whiskeys that are coming out of there right now. And, and yeah, so I thought I was going to stay with Ted and Dana Huber forever because they're the two nicest people that walk and they had a lot of opportunity for experimentation and all kinds of, we were laying down some good whiskey and I got an offer and Drew Colesveen came out at a party at my daughter's house and said, hey, Lisa, I've been meaning to call you a family that we've been working with for years and the industry is going to build the first craft distillery in Nelson County, Kentucky. They think they'd be interested in you overseeing that project, which I did. So I stayed there for a year and thought I was going to stay on as distiller and my kids, my grown kids were like, you're going to be bored. <laughs> and so, you know, just because of the size of the project, right? So that's when I started saying some monsters. And I had a couple clients I had right out of the gates, one very small, one medium, and then Samson and Surrey called me. And I've been the consulting distiller at George Washington's distillery at Mount Vernon for five years this month. Wow. And and that's how my name ended up popping up because of the success of that program. And so the ghost of Dave Pickerel yeah. arises in so many of these episodes. Mm -hmm. Reading your bio before I saw the Mount Vernon connection, mm -hmm. of course, Dave was. I like Dave's stories. Well, he was instrumental <laughs> in the Mount Vernon resurrection, as it were. Mm -hmm. I was reading this. I'm like, you're like, I often call Dave Pickerel the Johnny Whiskey Seed yeah. of distilling. And I'm like, you're like the Dave Pickerel of woman distillers. You've had a hand in the development of many, quite a few brands. You're not the first person to say that to me. Yay! <laughs> Yeah. When Dave passed, God bless his soul, he and Steve Bayshore, who runs the program at Mount Vernon, uh, the three of us had been asked to speak at the American Whiskey Convention in Philadelphia. And it went fine. But the time before that, Dave had been gone and absent from the program for a while. And he decided to come back. We had a just uh, Steve did a distillers like reunion thing. And so he comes back and he's going to stay around for a few days. I had changed everything. So he's sitting there and he's mad <laughs> and he won't look at me. He's like, you have come a hell of a long way since I first met you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All that was missing was Missy. <laughs> yeah. And so we're like this, you know? And so Steve's like, okay. And so finally Dave's like, okay, we're going to just do it my way, you know, tomorrow. And we'll do it Lisa's way the day after. When he passed, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so sad that we had this like conflict before. And then later I thought, no, it's actually okay. We had quite the exchange. And I mean, we weren't like, you know what I mean? There was no like, it wasn't an angry conversation. Right, right. It didn't come to blows. Right. No, it didn't. It was just a difference of it. There's an old saying in wine making, 10 winemakers, one room, 14 opinions. And I always say distillers are worse. 10 distillers, 18 opinions, right? And <laughs> like I tell my crew, it's like, I always do it exactly like this, except for when I tell you to do exactly like that, right? <laughs> Yeah. And so later I thought, no, I think that was really fitting because then we did speak together and it was all great, you know, when we did yeah. that. But um, yeah. Now you work with Samson and Surrey. Did this predate Few Spirits joining? No. So you've worked with Paul Letko. Oh yeah. Paul, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Paul's wonderful. Yeah. I have visited the distillery in Evansville yeah. and just an incredible place. The place was a dry cleaners, <laughs> but Paul maintains that it was a chop shop. So wonderful origin story. But tell us about your work with Samson and Surrey, as well as Few. Yeah, you know, when they first called, when my boss first called me, I told him no, because they're like, I need somebody to move to New York. I'm like, oh, I just started this consulting business and my family's part of them have moved to Kentucky. I never dreamed I'd live in the same state with my grown children, let alone down the street. And so, you know, it's like some decisions and I was enjoying the consulting. And so he called on it. And so then he calls me a little a few weeks later and he's like, I'm just going to fly to Bardstown and take you to dinner. Let's talk. And so 10 minutes in, I'm like, oh, he knows. Knows he's charming. I know I'm going to work for him. <laughs> <laughs> but that was part of it, you know, so we decided that I'd keep my consulting business and I'd be hired on as a consultant at first. And he's telling me about Allison and Paul and the Mezcal Vago and meeting Andrew. Tequila, well, it's now Tequila Ocho is in the family. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. So we have quite the family, don't we have quite the feeling? Carlos Camarena, I mean, my God, the, you know, the God of, of tequila making. Yeah. As well as Tomas Estes, of course. But One of our sales guys one time, he's like, you know what, Samson and Surrey, we have a type. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we do. We're, so, <laughs> we're such different people, but we are a type. <laughs> Love it. You know, everybody's very quality driven and product development driven. And it's a remarkable group of people. I feel really honored to be part of the organization. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and then Paul, Paul's and I, you know, I always looked up to him as a craft distiller and he was like up here, you know, and I would go to American Craft Spirits Association conventions or something. And I was always in on his workshops when he's, mm -hmm. you know, talking. Yeah. Evanston, not Evansville. Evansville is Indiana. Evanston is Illinois. Yes, of course. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. I try not to take it for granted. You know, you get a text 
text message from Paul yesterday, you know, about something. And it's just like, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. Uh, yeah. Great. Yeah. The Samson and Surrey portfolio has really grown in the last just three years. Yes. Three, four, five years. Philadelphia, Blue Coat, and then all of these other brands like Tequila Ocho. Just incredible. Right. Now we've got Grand French Malt and we've got few and we have Mezcal and Tequila now, too. So Yeah. And we interviewed Allison in, uh, I don't know, episode six, seven or eight, very early in our run. Four, I think. Allison Park, number four. Yeah, okay. I think it was four. Yeah. Let me check. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's another person, too. I just admired from afar. It's like, it, you know, if somebody told me all these, I'd have all other phone numbers <laughs> in my phone, you know. <laughs> I was still scraping trench drains. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny with a smartphone, everyone is on speed dial. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and we know nobody's numbers anymore. I know three phone numbers. That's right. Yep. Episode four, Allison Park. Yep. Episode four. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you come to become a Brooklyn spirit? Tell us, how'd you come to Widow Jane? How did I personally come or how did Widow Jane come? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. We want to hear the Widow Jane origin story as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Widow Jane is eight and a half years old. It started as a chocolate factory. The previous owner decided he wanted to get into making a chocolate rum and it all went for there. Chocolate rum, you needed a DSP. Pickerel was in on this project early and sourced whiskey, right? Of course he was. Yeah. <laughs> and I usually don't say that because what you talked about earlier, I was going to throw that piece in, but yeah. And they sourced good whiskey and had a cult following. And then it changed in direction for him career-wise. And he sold Widow Jane to Samson and Surrey four years ago, or just over four years ago now. And so Samson and Surrey's owned it for half of its life now, mm. I guess. I had thought of that till just now. And then they brought me on three and a half years ago, almost four years ago now. And yeah, you know, I was tasked with originally changing the single barrel source whiskey to a five barrel small batch and just start blending it mm -hmm. so that oh, wow. we three states of origin on it so we didn't have to drop the age statement nice okay but, you know not knowing what the stocks of whiskey would be going forward right you know it's kind of like as i described to people it's like a river runs through it right you know as you know like okay i've got a little more indiana stock a little more kentucky stock but then you know, i'm always trying to work and make sure that i have that widow jane profile mm -hmm. and some certain notes that i'm always trying to hit with that and so anyway i was tasked with that and so i inherited some beautiful projects <laughs> here that just needed some polishing and the samson and surrey team behind them really yeah. and and we've got our water story, right? And so we still source, we source rice, we source bourbons. And at the same time, one of the other projects I inherited was the Baby Jane Corn, an open pollinated heirloom cross between Bloody Butcher and Wapsi Valley. Oh, wow. Uh, we've trademarked it as Baby Jane. And we grow that in three states. We grow that in upstate New York for production and seed corn. And the production corn all comes here to be distilled here in Brooklyn. And then we do grow seed corn in Pennsylvania because when you have a one of a kind crop, you can't grow seed corn in only one state because of kale and locust and acts of God, right? right? And so then the rest of it, we decided, and I'm, I'm supposed to be working on a larger distillery right now, and COVID sort of shut that project down for a minute. And so now it's starting to rumble around again. But in the meantime, we needed to lay, with the projections that we have, we needed to lay more whiskey down. So we actually had Peterson Farms of Kentucky grow our corn. We were the first craft project for them, heirloom crop for them. They grow for the big guys. Mm. And they've been approached by 20 some craft distillers and we we're the first ones that they said yes to. They'd approached wow. me when I built a small distillery in Nelson County in Bardstown. So because they had reached out to me there, I thought I picked up the phone and said, I know I'm not really there anymore. I'm out here. And fortunately for me, Bernard Peterson, his daughter lives in Manhattan and he and his wife were on their way out to visit and his sister and brother-in-law. And so he said, the timing's great. I'll come to the distillery. We'll talk. And 10 minutes in, he took me inside and said, I need to talk to my family, but I think we're going to do your project because the scale was so large wow. and for two years in a row until COVID we had the largest heirloom corn crop for whiskey in the United States and wow. so then I take that and we go to um, I cook heirloom corn quite differently than traditional yellow dunt I cooked a lot colder and longer and let's just say I've effed everything up over the years and so now <laughs> effed that must be code for something <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so now we lay down it. We use my protocol and Widow Jane Corn and we go to Castle and Key in Frankfort, Kentucky and we're laying barrels down there. Okay. Very cool. We do it periodically. I'm getting ready to go back to Kentucky in another week and a half yeah. overseas in relation there. For we interviewed Sean Josephs, yeah. speaking of Castle and Key, again, some episodes ago. That's awesome. Yeah. It's like, I'm very honored. I was honored already, but not really honored. <laughs> <laughs> 
So the whiskey, the labels tell a story, and I'm not sure what the story is. There's one. Sean Joseph, episode 33. 33. Okay. Uh, 33. You are episode 39, for the record. Yes, yes. Oh, I like that. Or actually, our last episode before our season finale, and we wanted to pull you into this month. Yes, we're going to get you into uh, International Women's Month. Yes. So I'm looking right here at a bottle, Widow Jane, aged 10, 10 years in new American oak barrels, pure limestone mineral water from the legendary Rosendale Mines of New York, blend of straight bourbons. So these are sourced whiskeys, all of them straight by definition, meaning each of the straight bourbons is from a single state, and then you've blended them. What can you tell us about this? Oh, gosh, this has been a passion project. When I first was tasked with this, since there's no definition for small batch, they gave me some leeway on what we wanted to blend, and I settled into five. I was tied kind of between five and seven because there's several reasons. Number one, I was able to balance it without matching barrel to barrel to barrel. So if something isn't working, another barrel is going to have enough influence to change the blend up. There's always two things I'm looking for. I'm always looking for stone fruit, generally dark cherry, not always, sometimes dark, more of a dark plum or dried plum kind of flavor and baking spice, you know, kind of a general umbrella term because sometimes the cinnamon will come through a little bit stronger. Sometimes there's a little bit of allspice kind of thing going on. And so I've done all these things in infusions. Mm. So it's been interesting that, you know, over my other product development days and, and, you know, so it's interesting that we have these components. Something that happens too is our water that comes out of the Widow Jean mine is phenomenal. When you first, you know, you're taking on the project and they're telling you the, all these components. And the first time I go up to the cave, the Widow Jane mine, you can actually visit. It's open. You can go to the Century House historic site and see Snyder's house. He used to be the owner of the um, cement company. And that's where the legend comes out of that Widow Jane, when he passed away, there was a woman in his life who was very kind and that the mine got named the Widow Jane mine. And, but folklore, like I said, you know, it's hard to, what part of it's the truth and what part of it's the story being retold several times. And so, but our mine backs up. So our mine's obviously under lock and key because I'm a little particular about the whiskey quality. And, but the first time I go up there, your eyes have to adjust and you just hit in the face with this minerality. It's amazing, right? One of my favorite characters characteristics in a grown varietal type wine minerality, right? And so it's just there. Interestingly enough, when you're trying different waters, I encourage people to do this experiment. Get a cast drink whiskey. We don't have one because it wouldn't be Widow Jane without our Widow Jane water. And let a very famous French mineral water in a green bottle go flat and proof a cast drink <laughs> mineral water and then proof it down with like distilled water or reverse osmosis water. And you'll be surprised that the, what the minerals pop in your whiskey. Interesting. Yeah. And so for us, the things that it really pops the notes of that, like I said, the dark cherry and the dark stone fruit and the baking spice. Mm -hmm. So it's been quite the passion project. The guys are downstairs right now bottling batch 374. We can hear them. We'll know that those sounds are batch 374. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can see this. It has fantastic legs. And I do get a lot of baking spices on the palate as well as the cherry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, very much. And it's got a beautiful aroma. I have a younger batch. I have batch 186. Yeah, a lot of dry cinnamon, mm -hmm. you know, not has mm -hmm. anything baked yet. Yeah, this is batch 312 that we're sampling today. Yep, 312. Yeah, it's 91 proof. It doesn't drink terribly hot. Nope, it's lovely. There's a lot going on here. We're big, old whiskey. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're known for. That's what I try to blend. I don't want anything too flat. Mm -hmm. Not that I don't enjoy, like, whiskey's complexity on this one is remarkable. Mm -hmm. Some of the blending whiskeys are very solid, good whiskeys. But boy, you can take a really good whiskey and really enhance it by blending it. How many straight bourbons are in here? And how many typically go into a batch of Widow Jane 10? Oh, every batch has all three states represented. Three, three. And the three states again are? Indiana, Tennessee, and Kentucky. Okay. It's the stacked tenure. I know. I love the fact that I was born and raised in Bloomington, too, and that, you know, some of the best whiskey in the world comes out of Indiana, even I live Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All of that. How far from the border are you? Where I grew up? Yeah. Just a couple of yeah, I was just okay. Sort of okay. All right. One of the things when we first discussed your appearing on the program, normally most of the whiskey makers we interview, we go to the website, they make two, three, or four, or five expressions, and they send us those, and that's what we taste. But when we talked, you know, I'm looking at the website, and they're like somewhere between 12 and 24. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, wh whatever you say, uh, what do we <laughs> pick. So, anyway, what is that about? And how did you pick these three? 
Well, first, what I'm going to tell you is that when this is all over, you two are going to get a plane to come out here. We're going to taste all of it. Yay. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. You know, again, I inherited lots of, lots of, because just like most craft distilleries, when you start out, you know, they had done all kinds of experimental stuff, right? Because you have to, and you need to learn how all the different grains work and everything. So what happens is though, you end up, you know, with smaller lots of different, lots of large variety of whiskeys. So we have whittled it down, although we've expanded some of our other parts. We were known for a single barrel 12 year old. You know, at one time that was all Indiana, another time it was all Kentucky. And that was originally the 10 year old, right? And so that had gotten some age on it. And so we, and that also had a crazy cult following. People were insane about it. And then the whiskey turned 13 years old and something happened. I was getting barrels in that were under proof. And it's like, okay, because we all know whiskey loses proof or gains proof. Unusual for the middle part of the country, but in certain warehouses and rickhouses, it was starting. So it's like, okay, well, tell my boss. I'm like, I think we should name it like uh, it's dark you know what a change can be a little dark and we'll name it unlucky 13 he's like please we're not naming anything unlucky (laughs) (laughs) he immediately said let's go lucky 13 and and so what i decided to do rather than bring all of them down to the lowest proof that you know, I was going to have to do to accommodate getting some Widow Jane water in. We stagger those proofs. So they'll be anywhere from 91 to 99. I get it as high as I can with making sure that I have enough water to influence the flavor of those. And it's been a crazy successful program, right? And it's been fun. It's fun to explain to people, you know, what happens to all whiskey nerds, right? Mm-hmm. And we love knowing that you can take two sister barrels from the same lot from the same day and put them next to each other and you're not going to have the same product in both exactly. of those barrels, right? And that's part of the excitement. And some days the frustration you know of this business but yeah yeah and so we've had that and then decadence we did a largest batches that i ever do were 21 to 23 barrels maybe one of these days i'll get up to 25 but the decadence was blended 21 23 barrels and then we had a relationship or we have a relationship with the crown maple syrup of upstate new york and for years it used our bourbon barrels for their their maple syrup and we just reversed the process you know it's like send them back and we'll finish this and so the idea there wasn't something sticky sweet i didn't want it to be I wanted it to be a standalone whiskey. In fact, the last blend that I did for Decadence, the, our director of operations and our warehouse manager, they're like, are you sure you went with this in the maple syrup barrels? It's such a good standalone blend. And I said, well, no, that's the point. That's the point. It, we're not trying to cover anything up. We're just trying to enhance already good whiskey. Really- right. Yeah. The About Widow Jane description on the website states that it is home to one of the country's largest holdings of long-aged bourbons. Yes. That must be an absolute it is- playground for you. Last night, it was going over some numbers and just have those moments where you're like, oh my gosh, how did this happen? This looks so exciting, you know? And yeah, we've got- It's like a 1970s shopping mall. <laughs> <laughs> Just a wonder world of availabilities and yeah. choices. And <laughs> it's a dream come true. You know, it really is because not only are we allowed to lay down some fabulous whiskey of our own, just being able to, like you said, it's a playground. And you sit down because, you know, we don't have room to store it. We've got things aging here, but we can't bring everything here. And so we've got stuff, you know, it's still back in the middle part of the country. But, you know, sitting down and trying to figure out with your barrel manager and your director of operations and everybody, like, okay, well, let's start pulling these barrels in from this road. Because now we know the trends. Now we know some. Of the flavor profiles that come out of particular warehouses it's like okay guys so rather than drawing down like a whole stock from one place we'll like we'll cherry pick from different places knowing that those are going to be a little bit better and a little bit broader representation of what we have and it's exciting you know mm. it's like we had some whiskey we purchased that when i first started it wasn't drinking as old as the age statement was on it was really good whiskey it was really solid and clean and just a night you know it's just like gosh if you had a glass of it, you'd just think this is this is really lovely and um but if someone told you the age on you you're like oh there's no way it's that old Mm -hmm. and so we moved it and we moved it to a lower profile warehouse now it's like whoa it's on a wild ride (laughs) (laughs) it's wild ride yeah now we have a couple of whiskeys that um i hesitate to call them rye Mm whiskeys because that's not what's on the label the label reads widow jane whiskey distilled from a rye mash that label came. Now we're at straight whiskeys and we're like, watch us. Let's just say, pay attention to what's happening. But they came up with that label when the whiskey was not two years old. Ah, uh, so it could not be called straight rye. Correct. Mm-hmm. Got it. Correct. And so. All right. So I'm going to take a smell. Ooh. So these are straight ryes now? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. All straight right. ryes now. And then I've changed to, they were batting them before. And mm-hmm. it was such a that it was fine, but you know, whiskey blender slash control freak, and so <laughs> I blend everything five 
<laughs> Carrie and I, that resonates with both Carrie and me. Yes. yes. <laughs> Whiskey drinkers and control freaks. That is correct. <laughs> Here to control freaks. Yay, Here's the control, to freaks. control freaks. Okay. So talk to us about these. We have two of them. One is American Oak Aged. Uh, and the other is oak and applewood aged. I can't wait to try the applewood. They're both 91 proof. How do they tell us the mechanics? Of- yeah, simple, elegant, right? Whiskies, uh, people that don't say, oh my gosh, you know, we're all whiskey drinkers. So I'm sure you like, you know, big, hearty rye whiskey as much as I do. But for people, that is a little too much, right? Uh, this one's a softer, sweeter rye. We certainly have those rye notes. It's like a light rye bread as opposed to- It like, is. It, that right? I was going to say it too. Mm-hmm. I've got a very rye bread. Yeah. No caraway seeds. <laughs> yeah. I would just have this with rye bread and a little butter. Yeah, have a spritz. That's a lot. Although add caraway, it'd be a kick-ass aquavit. Oh my gosh. Ah, there's an idea. Okay. You just inspired her. <laughs> so when that comes, it'll have inspired by Philip Dobart on the label. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> Use it with attribution. Okay. Yeah. So the thing that surprises people, I mean, the, one of our last tastings last year, it was a really large group and we divided them in a couple things, but hearing the murmurs of people, because I had the, some other people here giving the tour and I was behind them and hadn't been introduced yet. So people didn't know what I did. And people were like, oh my gosh, I didn't think I liked dry whiskey, but I love this. Yeah. And we get a lot of that. It's a really great price point on this stuff and great cocktail base. What I discovered about the American Oak last summer with all the lockdowns, I had gone back to Kentucky because of needing to be near family and long, hot days, right? And I started putting this in iced tea glass with some ice and there's a lemon lime note that just pops ah. in this. Now that I tell you that, you can probably taste it, but yeah, yeah, it's just was really refreshing and I had never thought to drink it that way before and I can't wait. And people this. thought you were actually drinking iced tea. Yes. <laughs> Not in Bart's. <laughs> I'm getting notes of 7-Up. Yes. Bart's Town's a kind of where I, I live on Main Street and so like my street is the best street in the whole United States, I swear. And so, you know, you start coming down the front porch and then your neighbor next door might just happen to be a distiller himself and then the other people that they're all whiskey drinkers. And so the next thing you know, you got everybody's chairs pulled up in your front yard and the bottles are out. So it's- I love it. And there yeah. come the 76 trombones. 76 trombones in the big parade. Yes. <laughs> that was fun. Yes. This is Bart. Okay. So this is American Oak Aged. So this is Quercus Alba, aged how long? Two to four years. Two to four years. And is it a high corn rye? Does that account for its sort of easiness? And then I'm telling you the wrong answer. I'm listening to you and trying to process <laughs> And there was a little bit of a delay. No, it's a high rye. Yeah. Okay. What's that? I'm sorry. It's a high rye. It's a high rye mash bill. A high rye mash bill. Okay. All right. But you nonetheless were able to achieve the sweetness. Yeah. You know, and some of that is because we supplement the barrels with staves after mm. the whiskey, after it's drinking. Nice. And American Oak Staves, another project that I inherited and, you know, I've polished up a little bit, but like I said, I'm now blending five barrels at a time so that we can get the balance okay. to match what we're doing with the other ones. It's proof down with yeah. the mine water, well, but it tastes like Widow Jane. I mean, you know, when you come here, okay. you know, with the tour of whiskey, right? You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, this is so fun. We recently interviewed both Rob Arnold and Robin Robinson. Who will be premiering our first and second episode of season two. And we're going to have them back to back because they don't necessarily agree with each other <laughs> right interesting i didn't know i know where rob arnold stands yeah uh, yeah robin is very much yeah terroir not so much felt that way that's really interesting yeah. yeah but and they both have books out and we're going to be giving away one of each for contests so for listeners stay tuned for season two because we got a lot of good stuff coming up yeah but- free stuff if you win but interesting, you mentioned broken staves. We, we recently, a good friend of the enterprise is Seth Ben Haim yes. here in Los Angeles, owner of Broken Barrel Whiskey Company, yep. which is also, in terms of its whiskey blending, et cetera, is based in Bardstown. And uh, they work closely with Jacob Call at Green River. Yep. Which episode was Jacob Call, Carrie? I know. Oh, hold on. Let me check. Let me check. Jacob Call. <laughs> Yes, Lisa, you were in very good company. Sorry on everyone. I have a story on Jacob Ball. I got to tell. Uh, oh, Jacob okay. Call, please. Episode 29. Jacob there we go. Call. Uh, that was a prime yeah. episode. Yeah. So, <laughs> so <laughs> speaking of all these numbers, next week's episode, the finale, we are going to do kind of a recap about all of the people we've seen. Or not, well, not seen. The episode we've only started yours. seeing people. Yeah. But we are going to kind of do a recap and have some clips of everything, all the highlights of the season. So that should be a fun episode. Yeah. That sounds like a fun episode. Yeah. Jacob's awesome. Yeah. He's great. He's always so late. That was a great interview. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I'm chomping at the bit to try this Applewood because my favorite bacon is Applewood smoked. Oh, yeah. So 
Yeah. And I have some in my freezer that I've been holding on to because I wanted to, after I opened this bottle, I wanted to see if I should pair them up. So making me think it needs to be like applewood bacon, cheddar, grilled cheese kind of thing. Yeah. With an egg on top. Yeah. I think that sounds like a good lunch for when we're finished here. (laughs) Oh, it's got a beautiful aroma on the nose. Presumably this is also Quercus Alba. American oak? It is. And then we add the applewood staves. We get the applewood staves out of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I like to repatriate everything to New York. So I always say, you know, if anybody's got an aunt or uncle with an orchard here where they're regularly harvesting their trees, (laughs) to know who that is. But we have a source in Minnesota that we trust and have, you know, as consistent as wood can be. Mm Mm-hmm. And the applewood staves are, I mean, it's delicious. It comes in somewhere like a Calvin, we're between Calvados and Mina. Yeah, exactly. I made a cocktail out of it recently that was supposed to be for Applejack, but I made it with this instead. But it was, in, you know, so it was like applewood sour. It was uh-huh. delicious. I oh, wow. Orange juice, lemon juice, and yeah, yeah and some sponge bitters. Yeah. And it's, it's really, really too bad we don't have a brandy show because Lisa Laird Dunn has been a great friend of the enterprise for many years. Well, that's actually embarrassing enough. It's sitting on my floor in my apartment here in Brooklyn, but yeah, it's a staple. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. yeah. No, Calvados. I adore Calvados. And now that you, yeah, all that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now that's delicious. I taste a little bit essences of the first rye I can taste, and which is probably the rye, but I definitely uh, get the applewood on this. And I think after we hang up, I'm going to go get my bacon and make a grilled cheese with this. It's delicious. Yeah. There's apple at the core. Indeed. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Yeah, and there's a little floral to it, almost like apple blossom. I mean, with yeah, that, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, it's just lovely. It's so delicate, you know, in a way, but at the same time, it, like I said, it can really hold its own in a cocktail. So you could call this Granny Speak- Jane. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of cocktails, why don't we move into cocktails? Let's talk cocktails. It's a good transition. We like to hear what our guests, what their favorite category is, their go tos, both with and without what they make talk to us. Oh gosh, cocktails. My son-in-law's and son's old fashions, Manhattan's, all the standards, whiskey sours, you know, it's really hard. 90% of our guests start with stirred aromatics, just as you did, yeah. because they're spirit forward. Yeah. And it's also, if you're going to test out a bartender, if they're not going to make you a decent Manhattan, then you're like, well, okay. I'm Get out of here. Mm-hmm. I have a story about a Manhattan. There's a bar here in North Hollywood that is literally shaped like a barrel. And when it first opened, basically, well, it reopened. There's a whole history behind it, but that, I'm not going to get into that. But when it first reopened, they had some kid waiter who obviously <laughs> the waiters had not been put through bartending training. Like a kid goat, but a kid waiter. I mean, if he had to be 21, then he was only 21, but he could have been just 18. I don't know. But so I ordered, I think I looked at their selection and I was in a rye mood and they had bullet rye, which I do like. So I think I had ordered a bullet rye perfect Manhattan. He goes, oh, it's got to be perfect. And I said, okay, if you don't write that down, it won't come back that way. And I was like, don't make fun of the customer when they're calling out a drink. I said, because a very specific drink is what I just asked for. So if you don't put that, that's not what I'm going to get. And I said, a perfect Manhattan will have both dry and sweet vermouth. I said, so don't make fun of the customers. And maybe you should go learn about the bar drinks. And he was like, oh, <laughs> Yep. And yeah. By yeah. the way, that bar is Idle Hour. And it's owned by 1933 Group here in, here in Los Angeles. Yes, Idle Hour. Fantastic little place. Yeah. I had something similar happen here. I first started working in Brooklyn. And I go to a whiskey bar. And I ask for a few rye. Yeah. It's like, OK, I just want a few rye neat, please. Thanks. And she comes back. And I taste it. It's like, this is few bourbon. This isn't few rye. Yeah. She's like, oh, no, it isn't, ma'am. I said, I didn't tell her, you know, what I do or. (laughs) You're like, no, trust me. She goes back to the bar and she picks up angry, right? So she's angry and she takes it away. Like this one does not know what she's talking about. And then I can see her with an exchange with the bartender in the back and he's pointing like all the rye's are over there. (laughs) (laughs) And so she brings it back, you know, and and they charge me for that. (gasps) They charged you for the first one? Charged me for the first one. So I, oh. okay, yeah. I didn't yeah, not go back there. <laughs> that would have been tacky. You said, what the Florence? <laughs> Yes, it's been interesting. Few is like, named you know, after a woman, a, a, a temperance leader by the name of Florence. I forget E and the W. Do you remember? I do too. Don't ask me that. Don't put me on the spot. I'll be embarrassed. It's a great story. Well, Paul will tell it when he tells it when we have him on the show. But yes. yeah, yeah. So you live in both Brooklyn and Bardstown. So we can't call you bi-coastal. We could call you bi-statal. How does that work? <laughs> and how much time do you spend in each 
approximately? Well, with COVID, it shifted. I mean, I was in Brooklyn mostly anyway, but I was also traveling for work, right? So I was away for Barstown quite a bit. And but when I go back, because I'm distilling there, right? So, you know, I'll stay chunks at a time. And now I'm driving back and forth. That's a long time. I did have COVID in the spring. Oh, no. I lost my sense of taste and smell. Oh. I didn't tell anyone how bad it was for a while. It took about six weeks for it to come back. I did a lot of research on people that work with stroke victims that lose their taste and smell and did some of those therapies. So I don't know if it was uh, the placebo effect or the actual that I was putting in, but right. it all came back and I guard it with my life now. So I'm double mask. I drive, you know, a couple of people said, you know, it's probably okay if you go ahead and fly. I'm like, no, nope. not going to risk it. Right. So I drive back and forth. It's 14 hours one way, but it's worth it. You just do it. It sounds a little ridiculous, but I love what I do so much. It's like, was the worst part of the illness, the taste and smell, or was it, I mean, for you being in your position, then obviously that would be the biggest fear for me is that I wouldn't be able to continue what I do. But health wise, was that the worst part or was like the lungs bad or and more the mental game of it because I had it so early on I had it uh, we closed the distillery a year ago today and mm-hmm. uh, the, the lovely people that I work for that were concerned about me one of them called me and said you know you need to get back to Kentucky where you have family just in case you get sick or don't get stuck you know and things were falling apart in Brooklyn my guideline was always like if one of my staff gets sick will there be a hospital bed for them right that was kind of like my bottom as a mom of three kids and three beautiful in-law children and two grandsons you didn't have to go to the hospital and get put on a vent or anything? No, I did not. I was That's good. definitely a medium case. Thank God, you know, I was one of the lucky ones, right? But I was in Westchester, New York the day that they said it was the worst place in the United States for work. Yeah, I know. I was coming back from our, uh, coming back from Rosendale from the mine. I'd been at a dis- New York State Distillers Convention and or retreat that we go on every year and had stopped by the mine and was on my way home and had to stop in Westchester. NPR is saying, ah, it's the worst day for, or the worst place in the United States is Westchester. So 14 hours oh, there. Great. Wonder where you got it. <laughs> Yeah. 14 hours there, 14 hours back. You could spend all of your time listening to the Spirits of Whiskey podcast, yes? I did. I will. When I <laughs> so listening to you the whole way. There are some yeah. great shows I, therein. Yeah. Sometimes I'll listen to Mark Gillespie. And one of his daughters told me one time, Mark actually, I have coincidence with everybody, right? So Mark actually- He's also been on the show. Oh. Which episode is Mark Gillespie? <laughs> He's pretty recent. He is episode 35. Mark interviewed me early on with a product release I had for Limestone Branch. It was at the Kentucky Bourbon Festival. It wasn't bourbon. It was they, you know, Steve petitioned and we were allowed to pour it. It was the first brown spirit from Limestone Branch and I had worked on it. And so Mark tasted it. At first, he's really hesitant, but he comes back and tastes it and he looks at Steve. He goes, can I interview Lisa? Nice. And Steve's like, yeah. And so later, Mark looks me up on LinkedIn and he grew up in Brown County, Indiana. Brown County Winery is where I started. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's awesome. And so she goes, I can't listen to my dad like that because he used to read to us every night to go to sleep. She goes, I'd be falling asleep behind the wheel. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's when I listen to Mark is when I'm driving. And since COVID, I don't really go anywhere. I was like, I have to start listening to things at home more because like the radio, like I used to set my alarm every morning with the radio and listen to my morning show. And I miss those guys. (laughs) So I mean... Well, listen, so that we're not left wondering whatever happened to her, you promise to keep us up to date on Baby Jane? I will keep you up to date on Baby Jane. I will. All right. Yeah, we've laid thousands of barrels of late Baby Jane down, and it's getting really exciting. All right. Very cool. Very good. This whole Widow Jane story makes me think of this pond back home. We lived in San Jose, and there was these hills, the foothills, and my friend I've known since kindergarten, she lived right across the street from the foothill, and there was this random patch of trees surrounding a pond, and it was called Dottie's Pond. And there's many, many, many folklore stories of how it came to be. So those kind of stories are always very intriguing to me, these little random folklore. They are, aren't they? I know. Yeah, I know. So anyway, this has been fantastic. These whiskeys are delicious, and I'm seriously going to go get my bacon wood smoked bacon and have it. (laughs) We're so fortunate to have ropered you in to joining us. (laughs) (laughs) One last sip. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Salangeva. Cheers, Lisa. World of Wheezy is up next. Stay with us. The Center for Culinary Culture, home to the Cocktail Collection, has a YouTube channel, Eats, Drinks, TV. Streaming now are cocktails, the grand tour, culinary quickies, music and booze with Mo, V is for Vino, and this podcast, Spirits of Whiskey, New shows coming soon include Complete Greek, Mighty Fine Wine, and Spirits of Rum, 
a podcast featuring personalities from the wide world of cane spirits. Find us on YouTube at Eat Strengths TV and subscribe now. The Center for Culinary Culture, telling the story of food and drink, one taste at a time. For more information, visit culinaryculture.center. Hey Louise, nice to have you back. This week we're going to be talking about Widow Jane. Of the three expressions that I brought to you for Widow Jane, which one did you like and what did you want to pair with it or cook with it? Well, hey there, it feels great to be back. And yes, thank you for dropping off such a large collection of whiskey for me. Uh, <laughs> I, it was super exciting to see Widow Jane. I, I used to live in Brooklyn, so I know all about this distillery. And Widow Jane is in Red Hook, Brooklyn, and... I used to live in Brooklyn, not in Red Hook, but I have a lot of friends that live over in that part of the borough, and I've been familiar with them for a long time, so I was really excited to taste a few of their expressions and figure out what I was going to do with it, and I decided to use the American oak. You know, one of the things that Widow Jane does is this distillery exemplifies the Brooklyn mentality of keeping it local. and. They source their water, it's pure limestone mineral water from the Rosendale Mines, which are about 100 miles north of the city. And these mines helped build some of the most famous structures in New York. The limestone came from these mines to help build the Brooklyn Bridge, the base of the Statue of Liberty, the Empire State Building, Grand Central Terminal. So I love that such a huge importance in their process is using this water. I mean, that's so New York to me. Like, we have the best water and this is what we're going to use. And I love that. <laughs> As I started thinking about this, you know, just hyper locality of everything, some friends of mine, the Pickett Brothers, started a ginger syrup company many years ago. And it's... Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, they're making these really, really delicious ginger syrups that sort of vary in strength and spiciness. And they're meant to be used to make your own homemade ginger beer, you know? So okay. I figured, well, why not make a version of a mule and, and have it be a Brooklyn mule with the Widow Jane American Oak, a bit of the pickets. You know, you could throw in some bitters if you want to keep it Brooklyn. You could do uh, bitters from Hella Cocktail Company. And those boys are, those are New Yorkers. And then splash a seltzer or, you know, so have a little bit of lime and you got yourself a nice cocktail there. So cool. kind of what I just That sounds very refreshing. With that expression this week and, and I might say quite delicious. That sounds delicious. I really am intrigued by this ginger syrup. That sounds pretty cool. Oh, yeah. It's all over the place. I mean, I it's sold here in LA. I've seen it at my local cocktail store. I actually know one of the, the, the guy who started it actually passed away from cancer a few years back. Oh, sad. Very, yes, very sad. It's three brothers and Jim started it. Unfortunately, he passed away, but the brothers are carrying it on for him. He was just a super fun, awesome guy. I know his brother Bob because I know him from the beer world and we also lived in the same neighborhood and drank at the same local tavern. So it's like Brooklyn back in the day was very, oh, cool. you know, everyone knew each other if you were into anything that had to do with either craft brewing, craft distilling, you know, good food, right? all that. So yeah, so I'm, I'm more than happy to get everybody drinking their ginger syrup. Sounds great. All right, cool. Well, I can't wait to try this one and I can't wait to see what you come up with for us next week. Sounds good. I'll talk to you then. For show notes on today's podcast, please visit our website at spiritsofwhiskey.com. That's whiskey with an E. We'll include links and supporting documents from today's Whiskey Chronicles, as well as tasting notes and recommendations from today's World of Wheezy. As always, you'll see upcoming topics, a guest roster, and links to past shows. Sign up to become a VIP member of Spirits of Whiskey. With your membership, you'll have access to listen to our series, The Malting Floor, be able to watch extra video content related to past episodes, and you'll enjoy access to our webcast series and other spin-offs not available to anyone else. Enroll now by making a monthly donation at anchor.fm slash spirits of whiskey. Click on the support button and select the contribution level that's right for you. Once you've submitted your payment information, visit our website at spiritsofwhiskey.com to create your personal VIP profile. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, Slanchava. 
Spirits of Whiskey is produced by First Real Entertainment and the Center for Culinary Culture, home of the Cocktail Collection, and is available via Anchor, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and wherever fine podcasts are heard. 